What is up people, welcome back to Carrot Corner Poker Education. In today's video, you're gonna see an incredibly important bit of coaching. You're gonna see me playing a 200 Zoom session in real time. What this means is that you're just going to see the most important thoughts that I pick out for making my decisions. There won't be any over analyzing and you'll see me streamline my thought process to get the best out of the limited time that I have available. Let's get into the action and I hope you enjoy it. All right, off we go, guys. I think it's cool to do this sort of live play session where you get to see all the trials and tribulations of me making in-game decisions under duress, under time and monetary pressure and having to articulate myself at the same time. So I think this is going to be cool. It's nice to see these pre-recorded sessions where I have all the time in the world to construct a thought process and explain everything in detail. But I think another useful skill for you guys to see is how a strong poker player would actually just approach tough decisions in real time. So let's do that today and we'll try not to trip over on our words too much or mess up our lines. Hopefully we get a spot here with the King Queen. Blind versus blind, this is a hand that usually wants to call. I do have an RNG on screen and what I'm going to do here is just roll this and I will 3-bet it on a, a very low number, otherwise I'll just be calling. These hands can do either. When you have like a thin value hand like this, you can really do anything. If you have a hand like King 10 or King Jack, it's a bit more important that you just call. Basically, blind versus blind, there's a part of your range that's very mediocre that doesn't want to play a lot of raise. And the same thing is, is true on the flop here. So when we have a hand like this, raise is going to be completely off the table because what it's going to do is it's going to reopen the action for no good reason in position. And it's going to be a polarization error to boot. So we're going to be raising here with the middle of our range. And that's something you typically want to avoid unless you have an incredibly vulnerable holding. Obviously, the king turn is really good for us. We do need to understand on this board with multiple straights and boats possible that this is far from nutted. But this is what we'd refer to as a tier two hand, something coming in at about 86% equity, I would guess. And I'm going to be using this sizing. This big sizing is something I use in position because I don't really want to reopen action for small bets here. It doesn't really make sense. There's no point. A strong player will be protecting their range in the spot. When villain check calls the turn, they're most likely holding is by far ace x, maybe some jack x with gutter, maybe some weak king. They shouldn't have many hands that beat us here and we need to decide on a ripper strategy. We can either be 75 again or if we're confident that our opponent's range is a bit more capped now, we can actually go for an overbet on this node. I think I prefer b75 with this combo though. I think if we overbet, we'll start to move a little bit closer to the realm where we'd run into like the slow played boats and things of the world and hands that just crush the deck like Ace King a little bit more frequently. And that's not terrible. We can overbet here. I think the hand has enough equity, but I think in practice, the B75 is just going to be the more prosperous sizing. It's going to allow our opponent's range to just remain a bit wider when they call us on the river there. And it's going to increase equity when called a lot. If I didn't think people were going to overfold to overbetting, I think it would be an equal EV line. But I think overbet is going to be more overfolded to, meaning people will fold more than the GTO recommended amount if I overbet there compared with if I go smaller. The reason I think that is just that the bluff catchers that people have there, which are just naked ASX, just look particularly flimsy in this spot. Guys, the Carrot Poker School is now on sale at CarrotCorner.com, but here are four reasons why you should choose our school to improve your game before we get back to the action. One, the Carrot Poker School is extensive. It spans 31 and a half hours spread across three grades and will give you everything you need to master cash game poker. Two, feedback, an incredibly important thing for humans by completing 27 different homework tasks and three long exams with corresponding feedback videos, you'll get to see how well you're understanding the course every step of the way. Three, structure. I spent a long time planning out the syllabuses for the three grades of the Carrot Poker School so that we have 30 lectures which cover poker theory from start to finish with no overlap and no gaps. Fourthly and finally, it's professional. The videos are fully edited, polished and taught just like a rigorous university subject so that you know you're getting good value for your money. Now let's get back to the action. On to the next hand with Queen Jack. We're going to open here in the hijack. We have my name is Carl in the big blind, a well-known and fairly strong reg. When someone is a well-known and fairly strong reg, I'm going to give them the orange tag. Some of my blue tags, which indicate recreational players, are dished out a little bit unfairly. Sometimes I just give someone one because they do one thing I think is a bit dubious. Then they end up being a decent player. This guy, however, this is not really sizing we'd expect from a strong player. So I think it's reasonable to assume that this is indeed a correctly assigned blue tag in this spot. All right, pocket sevens here and we face a button open from my name is Carl. Going to go ahead and pure call this combo, reopening with a mediocre hand like this. Big blind versus button is not really something we have to do. We would, of course, be 3 betting this in the small blind. And on the flop, I think we have a very standard call. There is some hybrid raising here against a range bet strategy. 
meaning if Villain is betting everything in their range, then we can go ahead and raise with some hands like fours with the club, fives with the club. These pocket pairs are a little bit lower down that are benefiting from the fold equity more and have a little bit more redraw in the form of the flush draw and also block our opponents out. It's another reason why you might want to raise with a hand like fives with a club, but not with some other hands of that ilk. It's just that when you hit the five on the turn, it can never be a club, right? It can never bring the flush. That's different on a paired board. And actually on a paired board that goes out the window entirely because you make a boat on those turns but in an unpaired board it's very true. I think 7x will basically make up a fairly significant part of my opponent's river bluffing range so I think with two cards like it's 7 we can call this a dangler card. It's better just to go ahead and bet for value because you unblock a lot of ace high that can call but you block a lot of the hands that may bluff there. There are other hands that bluff of course as well as the 7 in that spot but I just think that's a particularly good hand to block bet for those reasons. In this spot, I'm actually not going to reopen with a 3-bet with the Queen Jack. I believe that Cold Call against a 50 big blind stack is just better. You could build a leading range on this flop, in fact you definitely should, but I expect my opponent to over C-bet. If he's going to C-bet too much, we get the chance to just call and see what happens. The King turn is obviously not fantastic for us, but I think what's going to happen here is that Villain's range will be very polarised to things that have hit the King and things that have missed entirely. If Villain has something like Ace-Queen here, they're just going to usually be folding, but when they've hit the King, they'll be calling. There'll be some other hands like 10s, 7s, aces, stuff that villain check back the flop with at some frequency. This will be a very thin block bet on the river if we choose to go for it. I think it's alright to go for a block here. I also think check is fine. I'm not entirely sure what the bluffs are going to be in this spot, so what I'm actually going to do here is just make a tiny block bet. If I suspect that my block bet is getting really, really thin, I might just shave a little bit more off of it and make it a tiny microscopic bet. That way I'm really minimizing what I lose when I run into the top of villain's range while also ensuring that they can just call wider. So that's a play that can be in your inventory. Don't feel like because you would normally block bet one third pot or one quarter pot that the other sizes go out the window because they should still be options for you. Easy fold here with jack six of spades to the three bet. So let me know in the comments, please do smash that like button as well if you're watching this because it really does help me grow the YouTube channel. If you let me know what formats you like in the comments also allows me to select better the kinds of videos I choose to bring you guys in future. If you like this fast and furious pace of just going over hand after hand in real time and you think it's a nice change of pace then let me know. If you don't like it, also let me know. I've had a very busy week just getting the Carrot Poker School ready, there's been a lot going on in life so it's nice just to chill here and play a one table session. Carrot Poker Skill is available on CarrotCorner.com. You can pick that up and save £500 by grabbing the full scholarship deal as we said at the start of the video. Ace 10, don't get any action with that one. On to the next. Ace 7, we are going to play this one. The only Ace X you don't want to play that's offsuit on the button is the Ace 2, Ace 3, everything else is going to be fine. Even Ace 6 is, is kind of marginal but it's probably fine, Ace 7 is a clear open. King 10 is a hand if we get 3 bet we're going to be mixing 4 bet and call. We get called here by the small blind player who seems to be a recreational by the stack size and just the general play here. This is something we call player type equals line equals read. So basically the player, sorry, line equals player type equals lead. So when they lead here this is just going to be a completely non-standard and silly thing for them to do. It's a board that dramatically favours the preflop raiser here. So this line is just not really a thing. It's not that it's bad or that it's a mistake with loads of hands that you can't do it. I just think it's a little bit silly. I think in a spot like this where Villain has a lot of high equity draws, like flush draws, jack 10, ace jack, I don't think jam is too ridiculous at all. If this wasn't double flush draw, I would just call here. But I think we can get called by worse. We can get called by merges like queen x or worse king x. I think we can also get lots of equity to fold. And I think we can also just get called by flush draws and things like this. So I'm just going to jam here. This is probably the weakest king I would do this with. But yeah, when we get called off when Villain makes errors like this, like calling off with the 5 3 of spades, that's another reason why jam is going to be good. With just one flush draw on the board, it may make more sense just to consider our opponent's range a little bit more polarised than equity, meaning that they have low equity bluffs or strong hands, and there's not a lot of point in raising against that type of range. However, against the range that we just saw there, raising is going to make a lot of sense. Ace Jack of Clubs is going to be a mix between call and 3-bet. I think it's going to be a bit more call than 3-bet. Good board for a range. We have nines here. We have a little drabs of queens, maybe. Villain goes for a small bet. They shouldn't be doing this too often, but when we have the rock bottom of our range, we can still go ahead and fold. We do want to make sure that we throw in some light defense and some races there if we do think our opponent's being overzealous with the c-bet strategy they're meant to keep their play in check there. Another bonus by the way of joining the Carrot Poker School is that you can actually get access to our Discord server. It's full of thriving poker conversation every day with hard working senseis teaching newer players how to get good at the game fast. Fast track your poker learning with the Carrot Poker School available on CarrotCorner.com. I love this avatar by the way, this is just like my the epitome of the poker nerd, this is what I imagine the average reg is, is going to look like after he's been playing for like 9 hours without taking a break, he's just an absolute poker junkie basically. 
10-9 here, I think we can mix. I'm gonna go 50-50 with this one. Quite a lot of three bet with a candidate hand like this. Call is also obviously fine. What you'll notice here is that in the big blind, I'm using a larger three bet size than normal. The reason I'm doing that is that my range is more polarized than normal. When you're gonna have a really compact, strong value range, like aces, kings, queens, a little bit of jacks, some ace, kings, some ace, queen suited, and then a bunch of bluffs, you're going to want to use a large sizing. If you have a more linear range because you're something like button versus under the gun, and there's still two uncapped ranges to act after you, you want to keep it smaller. That's why you will see people make very small three bets at these stakes when it's something like hijack versus cutoff, but they'll go really big when they're in the big blind. Sixes is the three-way mix between all of the options. I don't really care what I do. I roll a fold that time. I can't get away with playing that hand 100% of the time, but I can get away with either calling it sometimes or three betting it sometimes as long as I keep that under control. Pocket threes is going to be a really simple call here, never turning a hand with this much call EV into a three bet, that would somewhat ruin it. Maybe probably minus EV to three bet there, or maybe break even, but yeah, call is just going to be really good, and this is a clear fold. Even with the diamond there, it's still a pure fold. One thing you want to be aware of is which position you're against, and when you're facing an under the gun raise, you just have to be a bit more compact with your flop defense. So yeah, I will make more of these real time videos if you guys want. I think they're really cool actually, they really show you just how to keep a thought process compact and get to the things that really matter quickly. This is going to be an easy fold. When you're doing post session analysis I think it's easy to get lost in the weeds, whereas here you really have to get to the heart of what matters and no more. And this is a real skill, making sure that you don't have too much stuff going on in your poker thought process is really important. You want to have the right stuff going on and you want to have the right amount of it and you don't want to go overboard or get lost in the woods when you're thinking through a poker hand. If you guys are playing the World Series right now, let me know what's up. Let me know how it is to be in Vegas at this time. Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear how you guys' experience is going. GLGL to everyone playing the main event. If you see me bopping my head about like a maniac, it's because I'm listening to some liquid drum and bass. I do kind of have like unsettled, twitchy kind of things going on sometimes, but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm just basically vibing, chilling. Hopefully we get a spot against this weaker player. All right, nines in the big blind here against the button. Is this going to be a pure three bet? I think so, especially against the stack depth. Here, what I'm going to do is make my three bet a little bit smaller, and that's just because I would be three bet folding quite a lot of combos here as a bluff or as a sort of non-continue anyway. And therefore, I'm going to just give myself a little bit of savings effectively when my opponent jams. I'm obviously not folding nines, but that's besides the point. I don't really need to go any bigger. Do we want to play a polarized strategy here and actually check this hand, or do we want to make very small bets? I think either play is totally fine. I'm going to start with the route of just going very tiny on the flop here, and the reason that my c-bet is even smaller than usual, like quarter pot instead of third pot, is simply that my opponent is going to be short stacked here, and will be jamming sometimes, and just reacting exactly the same way to the third pot as they will the quarter pot, so I think it makes more sense to go like this. So now we have a hand that ostensibly could be a bluff in some configurations, where it's really dropped down. I think bluffing here is horrible though, because jamming I feel is going to be underfolded to, like we're really hoping our opponent folds like some ace jack, some top pair, something like this. I think we're better off just checking, and attempting to realize equity on this node against the stack. If I was deeper stacked and the positions were a bit tighter, like it was hijack big blind or hijack small blind or something like that more likely, I would definitely consider going ahead and turning the hand into a bluff there. But I think the fold equity is a little bit of a deficit given the SBR and just given the nature of the board. I think a lot of hands that call flop there will not be folding on turn in the eyes of a weaker player, even though a jack should be folding a decent amount to a sizable turn bet. Gonna check River, I think there's still a bit of showdown value here against something like Ace 10 that decides not to bluff, which should be an error on our opponent's part, but it can happen. Something like seven, something like fours. I think a lot of these hands should start bluffing now, but many opponents here in the button won't realize that. When he jams, it's a little bit weird. I mean, you check back the turn and then you jam on the river. We do have one blocker here to the flush. There are quite a lot of combos of things like Queen 10, Ace 10, things like this. And with the jam sizing, villains basically saying that they have a set. I'm gonna bluff catch in this spot, guys. Let's see what happens. Okay, they find a thin value shove with the king. That's a nice value shove because like our range is going to be really capped there. I don't think most recreational players are going to find that. And that's why I elected the call with the nine of spades blocker. I think mostly it's going to be two pair plus the value range there. And there's just a lot of combos here that we unblock like gutter and straight draw that called flop. So I think it's worth bluff catching on that node with nines with the nine of spades. The thing to understand is that it's actually better to have a hand like nines with the nine of spades as we've described our opponent's range than it is to have a hand like the king x of diamonds or something like that. 
Okay, in this spot, we're going to be playing big bets. I'll bet this hand about 60% of the time, and I will bet this time. You can also check here. It doesn't really matter what you do. So yeah, some bluff catches that you might see people make that look stationary because the absolute hand strength is quite low is actually going to be fine because they have the right blockers. And I actually expect the sort of scattered aggression there of call, flop, check, back, turn, then suddenly jam river. I actually expect this to be a bit over bluffed. He did find a nice thin value shove there, but I don't think that's going to be the norm. Okay, how much showdown value does Ace-King have on this note? It definitely has some. I'm going to check here with the club blocker as well. This is like not the suit we want. We'd rather have hearts or diamonds here for barreling because we would unblock some of these busted backdoor club hands, a okay, case 10 of clubs or something that's folding now. On this river, we do want a bluffing range in this spot. Do we want to bluff this hand? Does this hand ever win? I don't think so. Is this spot going to be folded enough? I'm honestly not too sure. I think the main problem I have with bluffing on that node is just simply that I think the checking range of our opponent might be a bit too strong because of the four straight. So I don't think they're going to value bet all of the hands they need to be value betting there theoretically. And if they do check too strong of a range, I can see the fold equity just being not so great for bet check bet on that particular run out. So we like to just give up there and pass on that bluff spot. I also think we're blocking some folds with the two cards we have there, which are often the kickers to the lower pairs that villain can have. Yeah, I'm not sure that's one we really want to take that spot. King 8 here is going to be a mix of 4 bet and fold. I'm just going to roll it and I'm going to fold this time. You could also flat this hand, it's right on the edge. Basically all three options would be okay there. King 9 definitely getting flatted sometimes. King 8, I think I think you can flat for sure. I think you can mix everything, but I rolled a really high number, so we just elect to go ahead and fold in that spot. 9-7 of diamonds on the fence with this one, but we will go ahead and open a 7-4. This isn't a board I'm going to range bet at all. In fact, I'm going to check my hand most of the time here. Do I want to pure check the 9-7? I think I do. Some 7x will do a bit of betting here. I think this one will probably just pure check. The reason I won't bet everything on a 7 4 is that there's lots of two pair making set making cards here, as well as a very polarizing ace. This is going to mean that Villain's Range has a lot of dreadful hands in it, like two Broadways, and a lot of hands that are just really good and never folding. Therefore, you just want to play small bets, but you don't even want to bet all the time. You just want to play them at some frequency. With blockers to value hands here, having the 7, I think you're definitely going to want to call River in this spot, in game theory at least. Villain should be probably big betting a king here, I would think. When they check, there's definitely no value though. And the 10-9, see these are the, the sort of hands that's very tricky to have, right? Because if you always bluff that 10-9, you're going to end up... I'm going to sit out and actually talk about that in a bit more detail. So this is actually a really tricky spot from our opponent's point of view, because when you get to this river with 10 high here, you're aware that you need to have a bluff frequency, because you have ace x still, you have slow play still that you didn't use earlier, and you also have some king x that you've just hit on the river, right, that you want to be value betting. So you can have block bets, big bets, over bets, and you should be mixing this hand into a bluff at decent frequency, I would think. There are some hands here that you definitely want to bluff with, and one of them is actually clubs. The reason that clubs are good to bluff with here is that when we check all the way to the river, the air we're going to have more frequently is going to be non-club because we're going to bet clubs at a higher frequency than diamonds on the flop and a higher frequency than the other three suits on the turn. Therefore, he's going to want to have this nine of clubs. I actually suspect that Equilibrium, like solvers, GTO, robots, whatever you want to call them, may bet this hand all of the time on the river. I think they probably will, but I can see Villain's sort of dilemma because when you start bluffing random low cards here without being selective, you do end up over bluffing very quickly with the range disadvantage and that's something you usually want to avoid. However, I think Villain could maybe use whether they have a club or not as a decent approximation of GTO and just be inclined to bluff here with a club and not bluff without one. I think that's a decent way to go. This is backwards to usual where you actually don't want to have the club when a hand's been played aggressively, when it's been played passively it's the opposite because flush draws don't reach the river in this way, they would if I'd been betting a lot and then checked or something like that. So two very different spots but an instructive point nonetheless. All right, Queen 10 of Clubs go for an open here, and the cutoff get called by a weaker player. This pool is nice today. I'm enjoying it. So I think bet and check are both totally reasonable here. I'm going to just start with bet. Quite like bet here. A very good board for a range. We're going to be betting a lot here, and I do like just juicing pots with backdoor flush draw open ender against recreationals. Check is also okay. It's a little bit of a frail hand, and that it's going to struggle to continue effectively against that stack, but you definitely don't want to check raise at 58 bigs there because you're creating such a lucrative rejam SBR for your opponent. So definitely want to like bet there. Probably always, I would say. Flop is straight here against the big blind. Queen Jack 10 is one of the few triple Broadway three straight boards that we're actually going to use large sizing on. 
I don't think we can ever check this hand. This hand is effectively the nuts because our opponent can't have ace king on this node. It's cool to notice that and you can just relax and chill unless it pairs or spades up on the turn. You're just going to be doing really well here. He should have a very low raise frequency in this spot because the nut advantage is so overwhelmingly in our favor. And that's what flop sizing is all about. You know, it's all about capitalizing on spots where you have a lot more nutted combos than your opponent. Your opponent's already capped. You have tons of hands that want to push the pot into a very large pot size and just make a lot of money by inflating pots towards that investment ceiling that your nutted hands can support. So you'll see me use a very small 3-bet here, that's because I have 3 uncapped ranges behind me and my main prerogative with this hand is just to isolate this player. I'm not trying to build gigantic pots and hope I get cold 4-bet or anything like that. So normally I would flat here but I'm actually just going to fold against a recreational. It's a little bit close already in these positions so I think call is marginally profitable but recreational's players really struggle to 4-bet bluff and they also struggle to thin value 4-bet. So in game theory you will see pocket 10s 4-bet sometimes here because it gets to deny equity to my hand, it gets to do a lot of cool stuff and when called it's in decent shape etc. It cries whenever it gets jammed on but that doesn't happen too much when we are in position and they are out of position but here the reason you're going to see me exploit fold in just a second after I deplete my time bank unnecessarily is because I think this will be too value heavy but too top tier value heavy rendering our hand a bit more dead than normal so let's pitch. These kind of exploitative folds are really important for you guys when you're playing against recreational players. My buddy Sam actually just reported folding kings preflop at the main event of the world series of poker last night and it seemed like a really good fold. The guy lo and behold had aces. You can do similar things just in cash games too where people are just not balancing their range properly when they make a 4-bet like that. Jack 8, super cool spot. Let's just take it because we're recording. We can't just say this all the time because we're always recording. We're basically always recording so just play like a maniac. Mace Queen 9, okay to range bet here. Not going to bother building any check. One thing about this board is that if we do check, our opponent is supposed to play a very timid turn strategy in equilibrium and that's going to mean they just realize equity unnecessarily. So you want to be pushing that ranged advantage and just betting everything on the flop so as to deny equity because checking isn't so lucrative when your opponent's range is weak because they're just not going to be bluffing a lot. They'll bluff sometimes but they have very strict standards in GTO about what they bluff. So against strong players, you just want to range bet there. Against bad players that are going to actually bluff too often, you can check back these amazing boards for your range with weak top pair for instance and just give them the chance to go wrong. It's a really important exploit. Exploits 101 here. If you like exploitative poker, why not check out Pio vs Population, the e-magazine series that shows you how people are getting it wrong and how to exploit them for it only at CarrotCorner.com. While you're there, you may also want to check out the Carrot Poker School if you haven't already. I went live a week ago while already selling it. Everything is working perfectly now. Major props to my COO for sorting all of that out and getting it all going smoothly. Jack 8 6, you can do anything. I'm just going to mix. I'm going to bet about 50% yeah, with this hand. That's a bit more than the global average for my range. If you ever hear me say the word global, put a globe on screen editor. When I say global, global, global. Yeah, did you do it? Let's hope so. YouTube, let's hope so. So now we want to be doing pure bet with this hand. I can over bet, I can big bet, I can do whatever I want. I think I'm going to choose big bets here. Or am I going to choose over bets? Over bets and blocks. This time I roll a block. I'm pure betting this hand. Queen 9 with a club, it's too good but too frail to check. Villain here is basically telling us that they have an ace, something like that. I don't expect this spot to really get bluffed much. I can either go nuts here and like 3 bet and then start jamming things. That's a cool play actually. Or I can just call and take the odds. I'm going to 3-bet and start jamming things. Yeah, it just folds right away. Interesting. I mean, there, like, I need to have some bluffs. I have the club remover because they aren't going to fold a flush draw in position there, so it's actually good to have the queen of clubs. And then my plan is that if you're going to raise me to merge there on the turn and basically take the middle of your range or top to middle of your range, like ace X, and just raise it to see where you're at, I'll tell you where you're at, bro. You're dead. Got a queen nine of clubs here. You're dead. Just, just give up. It's over. It's too late for you. Weaker player, apparently, I don't love 4-betting this hand against a weaker player. Normally I would mix 4-bet here with call. I am just going to call because my opponent's a bit weaker and that, what that usually means is they can be a bit sticky to 4-bets. So this is a sort of hand that will go down in EV for 4-betting. Again, we have a fairly frail hand here in an SBR where check raise is a little dicey. It's not so bad, like I don't hate check raise here by any means. I think it's okay. I think lead is also just good though. I think what I will do here is just roll and I'll go for a check this time and probably end up check raising but usually I will bet. But I've rolled a high number here which means I'm going to take the passive line initially and now we have a pure river bluff I believe. This is just super decent for our range and this is the bottom of it. I'm just going to roll for sizing here. There's a few different sizes that make sense. I roll an over bet on this occasion so that's what I'll do. Alright. Nice, nice. 
So yeah, you can use any size there because you have a value region that correlates with every size, right? You have a range that wants the block bet for value, you have a range that wants the big bet for value, and of course you have some over bets too. So there's no problem rolling your sizing. You don't want to lose sleep over that. You don't want to sit there and be like, shit man, which size is better for me to bluff on the river? It's only really your value hands and equilibrium that care, right? 25% three bet with this, roll the call this time. Jack, Jack, eight, horrible board for range. He's gonna be betting full frequency. We're going to be never raising against under the gun with this combo, I don't think, are we? Not without the back door. We need like eight, seven of hearts here to mix in a little bit of raise, I believe. So just to check call, turn is gonna be indifferent already. Although it's probably better by far to have a hand like nines here. I think we possibly have to pure continue this spot. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Do I roll any fold? The thing is here, this might be some fold with the seven, honestly. I think nine, eight and 10, eight are worse. I think this is probably a pure call, but it could be a mix of call and fold. And the reason I'm just going to call with it is that I know that calling won't be a mistake, but folding could be. So if the hand is not a mix, I could be making a mistake by folding, but if the hand is a mix, then I can't make a mistake anyway. I'm pretty sure that's not a pure fold. Therefore, I'm just not going to fold. So in the hijack, I'm not really going to be building any cold calls. So you see me just three bet the jacks here. There's a lot of people behind cold calling just loses EV the more people are left to act. So we want to go ahead and just play three bet or fold in that position. We would be building cold call, obviously on the button and the cutoff, stuff like this. Ace deuce against the recreational player. This is super close because the three bet's a bit smaller. I'm going to go ahead and call. We have a note here saying big station versus triple blind versus blind. That's not bad for us necessarily. If we do get lucky here and make a flush, then it's quite nice to know that our opponent is a station. That note actually helps our EV, because it makes us want to go thinner for value. It assures us that we can do so, and it's going to deter us from bluffing. So nice note to have, especially when it's not a recently taken note, because if it was recent, I think I'm just going to call here, because like when they reopen with the raise, it's just going to get really weird. I mean, I could raise here. I think I'm just going to keep it simple and just call. Lovely turn, giving us a few more bits of equity. I'm just going to call again on turn. Play my hand as basically a try to get there and win a big pot implied odds mining hand. So easy call here. I think turning this into a bluff against someone that's stationary is just a disaster. Just want to go ahead and call. Wouldn't be many raises here anyway. This is a spot where you want to play call only. My opponent could be overestimating how good this board is for something like Queens or King Jack or something like that. It's not a great spot. I don't know how aggressive this opponent is. When you river top pair though, you're going to just block value hands. You're usually not going to want to fold in this spot because you're blocking a hand like Ace Jack. The only real value hand here that goes triple, triple, triple is something like pocket jacks, ace jack, sixes, something like this. The deuce of diamonds is not a bad card to have here because villains busted flush does have nothing to do with this. <sighs> this is awkward. I think I'm going to call and the only reason is that this player's clearly just been spewy in the past. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily bluffy, but I just think it's quite likely. All right, nice. So when I've got a note like that, like big station against triple, how to explain this, it's not that I know exactly that that player is a state, that that player is going to be over bluffing because of that note, but any kind of deviation from sensible, logical, sane poker likely indicates that my opponent is just that sort of player type that's likely not just getting out of line with their calling. Someone that gets really out of line with their call strategy probably also gets quite out of line with their bet strategy more often than not. There will be exceptions. There will be that weird, unique poker player that's just like super passive and stationary but can't ever bring themselves to bluff, but that's a unique type. Usually when someone is like out of control in one way they're out of control in other ways too because they're humans they're not just like arbitrary poker programs that are designed to just do one thing wrong they're gonna do lots of different things wrong and they're all going to be in the direction of over investing usually or under investing but that isn't the note that we had so that note was really helpful there just inferring that from someone being stationary they're also probably over bluffing is kind of nice so yeah this isn't a hand that's got enormous call ev and equilibrium like having an ace is obviously good like i said because we block things like ace king ace six suited ace jack suited things that are going for value here the jam is interesting because villain doesn't actually have a lot of nutty combos here when they three bet in the small blind especially if they're recreational they might not have sixes or threes or fours because a lot of recreational players are just kind of trained to flat those combos pre so i have a hard time believing there's a lot of pocket pair in this range that really just leaves pocket jacks and ace jack and you'll see that by the time I got to the river here I was already starting to think about the fact that villain's range didn't contain a lot of natural value combos for going blast 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 three times. So when we face the third blast here and it's the all in, they're kind of just telling us I have ace jack, I have jacks, I have sixes, I have ace six, I bet twice for some bizarre reason. It doesn't really make sense for a whole load of value combos and saying it doesn't make sense for a whole load of value combos is not the same thing as saying that it doesn't make sense period 
it does make sense for some hands, but if villain just does it for like the king of spades, queen of clubs, and also the king of hearts, ten of diamonds, and also the king of clubs, eight of clubs, you know, it gets out of hand really quickly. To add the final bit of fuel to the bonfire here, knowing now that villain is actually three betting hands that are pure folds pre-flop, this just becomes stupidly overbluffed. This is something I call origin theory in grade E of the Carrot Poker School, which unlike the other three grades, which are for sale as videos on CarrotCorner.com, you're going to have to wait until September and sign up live. If you're interested in doing our exploit course, which uses loads of mass data that we've gathered, loads of theorems, loads of well-presented academic material on how to exploit pools, then you can sign up by getting in touch. Ask me in the comments below. You can also go ahead and email me. I will leave my contact details in the comments. In that course, we talk a lot about something called Origin Theorem, which is the idea that if somebody gets to the spot with too many combos pre-flop, they're just not going to be able to help themselves but overbluff. What hands actually get there here? 5, 7, deuce 5, you know, hands that just don't really exist. We block top set, we block ace jack. It's just going to be a really lucrative call spot. All right, guys, I am going to draw the video to a close just now. All right, we are done. I hope you enjoyed the fast, frantic format that we just did there. It was a load of fun. We had some cool spots. I think the main themes for today educationally are spotting overbluff situations. I believe we actually found two of them. Even though we only won with one of those calls, I think both of those spots were very overbluffed, especially the second one. Another thing we could take away from this session is just that when you have a weaker player that's erratic in some way, they're probably just out of line in many, many spots and you should just be over defending your ranges against them. And some other cool stuff came up there like why you need to range bet certain flops, how you can exploit people. Good poker is a mix of theory and exploits, and I hope that that's what you take away from our content here on our YouTube channel, Carrot Corner Poker Education. Don't forget, you can grab that Carrot Poker School at carrotcorner.com and save £500 by getting all three grades at once. Even if you want to start off at grade one and begin your poker education there, you can get all 31.5 hours of content, all of the exam content, all of the homework exercises and everything that's just going to give you the best chance possible, in our opinion, of getting good at cash game poker. See you in another video very soon. Bye for now, guys. Much love. Take care.